James chapter 3. If you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn to the third chapter of the letter of James to the church at Jerusalem. If not, follow along on the screens. You will see the words in a moment. How under heaven could the same thing that God uses to bless curse? How could something that could be used to be so uplifting be so discouraging? How could we use the very same object to sing and growl? I'm speaking today on the power of the tongue. Stand with me in honor of the reading of God's Word. Beginning in verse number 2, the Bible says, For we all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in word, he's a perfect man, able also to bridle the whole body. Indeed, we put bits in the horses' mouths that they may obey us, and we turn their whole body. Look also at ships. Although they were so large and are driven by fierce winds, they are turned by a very small rudder, wherever the pilot desires. Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. Father, speak in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. When I was writing this sermon, I began to see just a natural way of outlining the text. It's really the way a preacher preaches that desires to preach exegetically, which means to lift out of the text instead of eisegetically reading into the text. He begins by giving a revelation. That's what a preacher does. Someone says, what did your pastor speak on today? Well, he revealed some things the Bible says about the power of the tongue. Now, when you're preaching and you're giving revelation, oftentimes to make it even more aware to the people as to what the writer is saying, we give illustration. You begin to give windows so people can view in to get a better handle of the message. And oftentimes your people will leave knowing more about the illustration than the revelation. But then one of the things we preachers like to do, and I had one professor to debate whether this is needed. I do a good deal of it. But it's application. Someone says, if you give the revelation, God will make the application. I certainly concur with that sentiment, but sometimes for some of our people that are not as deep in the Word, haven't known the Lord that long, I believe it really helps to give applications. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to talk about the revelation of the tongue. We're going to move in and see two beautiful, biblical, simple illustrations, and then we're going to close this message by making application. In the scriptures, the tongue is variously described. Listen to the words that are used in your Bible to describe my tongue. Wicked, deceitful, perverse, filthy, corrupt, flattering, slanderous, gossiping, blasphemous, foolish, boasting, complaining, cursing, contentious, sensual, and vile. And then James makes this statement, and it's emphatic, and it includes everyone. He says, we all stumble. That's the word that can translate sin. It's a word that translates in chapter 2 and verse 10, the word offend. It's a present tense verb, which means it's a repeated action. It refers to a moral lapse, a failure to do what's right. But it is not a fatal fall. Solomon said that a good man will fall seven times and he'll get up again. James has moved quickly from dealing with the ministry of the tongue in James chapter 3 and verse 1, and now he's going to talk to us about the misuse of the tongue. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 18 and verse 21, death and life are in the power of the tongue. Think about that. As a gospel minister, as a Christian, God can use my tongue to give someone words that'll get them off the road to hell and on the road to heaven. There's life in the tongue, but there's also death in the tongue. We can speak condemnation. 
we can speak in such a way that we turn people off and they'd say, if that's a Christian, I don't want to be one. And they'll stumble into hell over our stumbling with our tongue, the power of the tongue. Don't ever underestimate the significance of the tongue. You just sang songs. Your tongues gave us words that edified the church. People were celebrating. Some were standing while you were singing. The power of the tongue. You can say, she's got a great voice, but the truth is, without a tongue, there is no voice to be delivered. James talks about the teacher's responsibility in verse 1, then quickly moves to the teacher's accountability in verse 2 and following. Since the tongue is the teacher's tool, a teacher is to guard the manner of exercise. So let's just begin by looking at what the Bible does in giving us revelation about this small organ in my mouth called the tongue. The Bible says we all stumble in many things. Uh, it means to trip up. It means failure in Christian duty. It, it can mean a moral mistake. None of God's children are perfect. There's no perfect people who always remain guiltless of a slip of a tongue or who never utter an idle or empty word. Have you ever spoke a word that you'd give anything to be able to retrieve? It's like the arrow. Once it's released from the bowstring, it's no turning back. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 10 and verse 19, in the multitude of words, sin is not lacking, but he who restrains his lips is wise. How many times I've been in a conversation and later when I left, I said this, I shouldn't have said that. I went too far. I was in a meeting the other day and there were some rather harsh things being said. I lead that meeting, 23 other people with me. Everybody was watching me. When the meeting was over, a couple of guys pulled me aside and said, I can't believe you didn't respond. Why didn't you say anything? I said, oh, it's biblical. Had I said something, I'd have said too much. There sometimes the best thing you can do is refrain. In many words, how many times have we ever said, you know, I appreciate what you said, but while we're at it, and then in many words, sin is not like, and you went far far down the road. When he says we stumble in many things, it means we stumble in many ways. James is reminding us of the fact that the choice saints are not always right in what they do and say. Now, I want, I want to give as fair a balance to this text as I can. Instead of just reading this text and us walking away today and say, man, I mean, he just kind of plowed ground, cleaned all our clocks, and patted us on the back and sent us home. It's a question whether I patted you on the back or slapped you. But I want you to listen to what the Bible says about some of God's choice saints to let you know that we're in pretty good company. Job 1.8, the Bible says, God speaking and said, Satan, have you considered my servant Job that there's none like him on the earth? He's blameless, upright. He fears God and shuns evil. Job said in chapter 40 and verse 3, he answered the Lord, Behold, I am thou. What shall I answer you? I lay my hand over my mouth. Isaiah, that godly prophet, my favorite of the major prophets, gave us that biblical prophetic word of the incarnation of God's Son, how Christ would come and our transgressions would be laid upon him. And yet that godly man, when he was at church one day, said these words, woe is me, I'm undone, I'm a man of unclean lips. Simon Peter. Peter answered and said, listen to this, Matthew 26, 33, even if all are made to stumble because of you, I will never be made to stumble. In the same chapter in verse 74, then he began to curse and swear saying, I do not know this man. It, how under heaven can the tongue do that? How can the tongue one minute bless the Lord and say everybody may forsake the Lord but not me and the next minute curse him and swear I'm telling you the mystery of this organ called the tongue the Bible says of Moses he was the humblest man that ever lived and yet we have recorded in Psalm 106 and verse 33 when he saw the people rebel against his spirit 
He spoke rashly. The word means unadvisably. He would not have been advised by God to say that. When we think of the great apostle Paul to the Gentiles, and by the way, I remember a statement my family used to make until they got saved. They'd be around me and they'd say something like this. Uh, that was enough to make a preacher cuss. Well, if that preacher's full of the Holy Ghost, he won't cuss. Are y'all all right? Just depends on who's in control or any other Christian as far as that matters. But probably the greatest missionary statesman in the New Testament outside of the Lord Jesus that gave us most of our New Testament, on one occasion he was before the high priest Ananias, and the Bible says that Ananias commanded one of the guards, said, hit him in the mouth. Now can you picture this? He just reached over Morgan and knocked the fire out of him. I probably backhanded him in the mouth just as fast. And, and Paul, before he could give it a second thought, said this, God will strike you, you whitewashed wall. You say, you think that's how he said it? I don't know, but it sure felt good saying it when you're mad, you know. I don't think he said, God will strike you, you whitewashed wall. No, I think he was, he was fired up. He hit him. It hurt. He was human. And when it hurt, it uh, hurt. But listen to this. He says, for you sit to judge me according to the law, and you command me to be struck contrary to law. But listen what happened. And those who stood by said, Paul, do not revile God's high priest. And then Paul thought, I, I didn't know Ananias was a high priest. Maybe he didn't know he was one because he weren't acting like one. But nonetheless, listen to how Paul responded. Then Paul said, I did not know, brethren, that he was the high priest. For it is written, you shall not speak evil of a ruler of your people. Here's what he was saying. Whether you honor, are y'all listening? Whether you honor the, the high priest Ananias, honor the high priest office. The control of the tongue is the barometer of the Christian maturity. Hey, have you ever observed someone who didn't respond to a critical attitude? Have you ever been looking in and somebody's just really railing someone and you're sitting there, your ears are turning red. And you're watching this, and then afterwards you say, I can't believe you didn't respond. And then you make this statement, he's a better man than I am. It may be true. She's a better woman than I am. What you're saying is, I'd have given a piece of my mind. You know what you just said? You'd become just like they are. The very thing you detest in someone else, you allow to creep into your own life. It is so second nature. He says, if anyone does not stumble in word, he's a perfect man, able also to bridle the whole body. James is telling us that if a person can be found who never is guilty of uttering a faulty expression, he would be so well balanced and thoroughly mature, he'd be able to control the rest of his body. When he uses the word perfect, he means full grown, complete, mature. He's reached the goal of James chapter 1 verse 4. Now, he says this person doesn't stumble. When he uses the word there, he's referring to habitual action. All of us stumble, but he's saying it doesn't have to be habitual. It, 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 has to, it, it ought to be like this. Someone says, man, did you see so-and-so? I know he's one of your best friends. Did you see how he lost his temper? Did you, did you see what he said? And then you'd be able to say this. What a word this would be from a best friend. Yes, I did. And I know him. You just wait. It's just a matter of time, Vic. He'll be back saying, boy, forgive me. The Holy Spirit of God convicted me of that. And then their best friend would be able to say this. I've walked beside him for years, and I can count on one hand the times I've seen him act like that. It's not habitual. There's a slip. We all have stumbled. There's not a person in here starting with the pulpit. And James, when he uses it to say it's all emphatic, he uses the word we, Bill, to say including Pastor James. And let me say as a Bible expositor, including Pastor Johnny. You see, words have power to justify or condemn. We will be judged by our words. Jesus said in Matthew 12, 36, I say to you that every idle word men may speak, they will give an account of it in the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. You may say, well, how in the world could somebody be judged or condemned or justified or condemned just based on their words? Because your words are an indication of your heart. 
This tongue does not have the capacity of its own to articulate anything that has not been rehearsed in the human heart. And so when, it, when a person begins to fly off and with a real temper, it just speaks of the uncontrolled temper of that individual's heart. Jesus speaking to the Pharisees in Matthew 12, 34 said, Brood of vipers, how can you being evil speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, mouth, the mouth speaks. A good man out of the good treasures of his heart brings forth good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasures bring forth evil things. Whatever is in here, when you put the bucket in the heart, it brings out by way of tongue what you found in the well. Psalm 39, 1 says, I will guard my ways lest I sin with my tongue. I will restrain my words with a muzzle while the wicked are before me. The Bible says when you're able to take this to heart, and you can uh, learn to not be habitual in the way you use your tongue in a bad way. He says you're able to bridle the whole body. Manton made this statement. He said the person who is able to control his tongue can do anything in Christianity. Have you ever thought about that? Think about that for a moment. Take the person whom God changes their heart and he begins to touch their tongue and, and they begin to say the good things and the right things. And they used their tongue to, to praise. And they used their tongue to edify and lift others up. I'm telling you, the world's wide open for that man or woman when it comes to being of use to the kingdom of God. Think about it. Your tongue, every person in the room's got one. Did you know instead of rushing out or rushing in, did you know that God may, if you'll listen to that small, still voice, God may have sent you here today to speak to the person sitting down beside you that you're not even sure who they are, but God may give you a word of encouragement that will flat give grace to the hearer. Don't you underestimate the significance and the power of the tongue. When a person's speech exalts Christ and honors God and edifies, one can be sure the rest of his life is spiritually healthy and vice versa. So the control of the tongue is evidence of extraordinary spiritual maturity. One of my favorite verses about the tongue and the word is found in Ephesians 4.29. I want you to hear how he tied it with the Holy Spirit. He says, let, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth. But what is good for necessary edification, that it might impart grace to the hearer. And listen to the next verse. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. Well, how do you grieve the Holy Spirit? God puts a word into your heart. And you ought to speak it and you didn't. And you say later, I feel bad that I didn't say what I should have said. But here's the real truth. If God gave it to you, you ought to say, I feel, oh, this is good. I feel bad that I didn't say what God told me to say. And no longer are you grieving yourself. You've grieved the Holy Ghost. Socrates, favorite quote of my sermon, said to a young student, Speak, friend, that I may see thee. Our speech reveals our heart. Let me move to the illustration. He says, now that's what I want to reveal to you. I just want you to know there's an incredible power in your tongue, Johnny. I want you to know that if you can just keep from stumbling the area of your life, I'm going to grow you up and you'll be mature. And I'll, I'll use that tongue in a lot of places to speak and, and to have opportunity to speak into people's lives, life. But then he gives the illustration. Let me walk through them quickly. He begins with the bit in the horse's mouth. As you know, when they take that bridle and put it over a horse's mouth, they take the bit and lie the tongue, the, the bit on top of the tongue. Now, the tongue is a small member of this half a ton animal. But you can control his whole body with that small bit. When you put that bit on his tongue, it controls his head. And as you turn his head, you turn his whole body. You control that large animal. Even if it's a well-ridden horse, he's not controllable without a bit in his mouth. 
So as long as they are expected to perform services, whether for riding or for pulling a wagon or a plow, they require that control. And so it is with the believer to be useful to God. We need our tongues controlled with everything else following in submission. So the lesson to be learned here is that man can direct a strong creature merely by controlling the creature's tongue. So without a bit and bridle, a horse runs wild with unguided strength. That's what's wrong in the life of a young man or young woman that is not where they ought to be with God. Misguided strength, they need the bit and bridle of Almighty God. It commands the mouth of the horse and you command the whole horse. So how does this illustration apply to us? The tongue, though small and seemingly insignificant, if, if, if left to go unbridled, it results in an uncontrolled man. How many of you have ever said this before? We need to pray for him, he's out of control. How do you know he's out of control? All you've got to do is listen. It's oftentimes not by what you see them do. It's by what you hear them say. And so a tongue controlled by the Lord Jesus can be a great blessing, but an uncontrolled tongue will bring much damage. He moves from that, and you think, wow, here's an a, a, a average horse. They tell me, I don't know this. I just read it. It weighs 1,000 pounds and, and, a, and a small bit that weighs probably just a couple of pounds placed on his tongue controls him. But he said, you think that's something? Take the large ships. And if we went to the New Testament, we'd find one that carried 276 passengers with all of the cargo that it was carrying on it as well when Paul and them shipwrecked. But the, it speaks of uh, ships with a rudder. The bottom line, he who controls the rudder controls the ship. He says it's a very small rudder. It's superlative used to emphasize the small things have power to control something much larger. And so the control of the rudder determines the course of the whole ship. Now, here's where it speaks to my heart. This may be my favorite part of the sermon. The Bible says that that ship is driven by fierce winds, harsh, strong, stiff winds, violent winds. It speaks of being subject to forces that cause them to be out of control. Look at me for just a moment. As a believer, whether it was this past week, Rodney, whether it's this week or it's next week, you know what will happen? The winds of adversity will glow, blow against the ship. And if the Holy Spirit of God is not the rudder that controls my life, you will find a pastor out of control. All of us have to deal with difficulties. The tongue could say, this is not fair. Why's God picking on me? Why this storm in my life? But I'm telling you, when we got the sweet rudder of God the Holy Spirit, it's amazing. It's not a playground. It's a battlefield. And he's given us everything that pertains to life and godliness. It's the words. It's the tongue. The tongue's the master control. Never doubt the power of the tiny tongue. Never underestimate it. Here's a good word. Many of the unfortunate ones are out of light on life's sea, driven with winds and tossed. They need a word of encouragement and counsel and cheer in order to comfort them. Just, just speak a word. Just speak a word before you get in your car today, before you show up at Sunday school. God may just give you a strong impression to hunt somebody down, find them. Say, hey, man, I just woke up burden for you this morning. Just speak a word. Speak a word. Well, let me close. Let me talk about the application of the tongue. Philosophers find out the disease of the mind by the tongue. Christians find out the disease of the soul by the tongue. He says, even so, the tongue, it introduces the application in comparison. It's a little member. It's little compared to the big horse. It's little compared to the ship. But here's the, the, the last defining statement. It boasts great things. The word boast is an interesting word. Take this home with you. The word boast translates to lift up the neck. It speaks of being arrogant. It speaks of being prideful. What if when I preached, I preached like this? Yeah, I'll tell you what, I'm glad y'all are here today. Yeah. Yeah, turn in your Bible, amen. Yeah. That's to lift up the neck. 
He's thinking, you know what, you, you just sit there right there and say, look, look, he looks so arrogant. Don't, don't, don't look arrogant. Look, don't look arrogant. <laughs> he, 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 uh, he looks over the people when he's talking to me. He doesn't have eye contact. He lifts up his neck. That's what it means to boast. So haughty speech, provocative language. One of my friends wrote a book on James, and we shared our books with one another. He gave me a quote this week. Listen to this. What is the difference between a fool and a mirror? A mirror reflects without speaking, while a fool speaks without reflecting. It is almost impossible in closing to exaggerate the power of the tongue. Are y'all listening? Almost impossible, the power of the tongue. It can sway multitudes for good and or bad. Take Jim Jones. His tongue led hundreds to their death. It can stir the wildest passions to fury. It can exalt man to his highest emotions. It can soothe the dying. It can damn the living. It can sing. It can growl. It can spread love. It can spread hate. By the power of the Holy Spirit, in our lives submitted to Jesus, we can speak gracious words, kind words, words that build us up rather than tear us down, that edify, comfort, bless, encourage. Words of humility, gratitude, peace, holiness, and wisdom. Words. Good night. Do we understand what God can do with our tongue? Do we realize how destructive it can be? God, make my tongue constructive today and not destructive. The power of the tongue. Hey, would you come to church with me next week? You might have spoke life for all eternity. He'll thank you for the invite with your tongue. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, Thank you for giving us a tongue. And I just want to rededicate my tongue to your service. Use my tongue so that people would hear Jesus speak through one of your servants.